Before we begin, I want to remind you that I have another show called Somewhere Sinister. You can watch it on YouTube or listen to it wherever you listen to podcasts. More information is in the information below. Thanks. Kansas City is one of the few cities that split between two states. When Missouri was admitted into the Union in 1820, it was one of the only areas in the land obtained in the Louisiana Purchase where slavery was legal. Kansas was established by mostly abolitionists, so when the Civil War started, the two states had a bit of a rivalry, to say the least. Kansas attempted to unify the city after the Civil War, making the whole of the city within the Kansas state border, but Missouri was not interested in losing a major metropolitan area. Today, there's still a rivalry between the two cities, though it usually shows itself most at sporting events. John Robinson was a lifetime scam artist who became well known to authorities for his constant embezzlement and fraud charges. It wasn't until women started going missing that the law in both Kansas and Missouri came together to put an end to his violence. This is Monsters. On January 12, 1985, a woman called the police in Overland Park, Kansas to report her sister-in-law and her daughter missing. Lisa Eldridge was born on April 11, 1965 in Huntsville, Alabama and had a childhood that was filled with unfortunate death. Her father and brother both died when she was young and she struggled for the rest of her youth. In 1983, when she was 17 years old, she dropped out of school and moved to Kansas City to try to get a fresh start on life. She knew nobody there and was starting over from scratch. One night, she went into a bar and the bartender served her a beer despite knowing she was underage. They began talking and the bartender, Kathy, took pity on the girl and offered her a place to stay. It wasn't long before Lisa became part of the group who hung out at the bar and it was there that she met a man named Carl Stacy. Lisa got pregnant and in August of 1984, she and Carl got married. She gave birth to their daughter, Tiffany, on September 3rd. Unfortunately, the honeymoon was short-lived and the relationship quickly became abusive. In October, Lisa took Tiffany and moved into the Hope House, a woman's shelter in Kansas City. Not long after, Carl went to Chicago where he re-enlisted into the Navy and was sent on deployment. At the beginning of January, Lisa was told by a counselor at the Hope House that a newly started outreach program had offered to help her. She would be able to move into the program's apartment and they would send her to school. She had expressed interest in becoming a screen printer and the director of the program, John Osborne, said that he knew of a silk screening program at a college in Dallas, Texas. He told her that they would pay for the schooling, give her an $800 a month stipend, and pay for childcare. Then they would assist her in getting a job after she graduated. It was an opportunity that sounded too good to be true, and there was a very good reason for that, because it was. Lisa and Tiffany stayed with her sister-in-law, also named Kathy, in Overland Park for a few days before John Osborne picked them up on January 9th. Despite Kathy and her husband David feeling something was off about the opportunity, they helped her load her luggage into John's car and wished her luck. John checked her into a room at the Overland Park Roadway Inn and spent the following day discussing the young woman's life with her. This was where he gathered as many details as he could about Lisa. Things that had happened in her past, the situation with her family, her short marriage, even her financial situation. The evening after Lisa left with John, she made a frantic call to her mother-in-law, Betty, and asked her why she was trying to get custody of Tiffany. Betty was doing no such thing, but Lisa said she saw signed affidavits that showed she was. Then she told Betty that she had signed multiple blank sheets of paper which were taken by them. She didn't clarify who them were. Suddenly, she said, they're here, I can't talk, and hung up the phone. That was the last time anybody in Lisa's family ever heard from her. Lisa checked out of the motel the following morning and disappeared. The same day, Lisa's in-laws called the hotel and found out that she was already gone. When they asked who paid for the room, they were told that a credit card for a business called Equitu was used and the name on the card was John Robinson. 
Lisa's brother-in-law, David, went to the Equitu office and demanded to know where Lisa and Tiffany were. He said an unknown man forced him out of the office. A few hours later, Kathy and David found a message on their answering machine from someone claiming to be Father Martin from the City Union Mission. He said that Lisa and Tiffany were fine and gave his phone number. Unsurprisingly, that phone number didn't work and when they called City Union Mission, they had no idea who Father Martin was. The following day, Betty got a letter in the mail that was typed but had Lisa's signature on the bottom. It said she had left Kansas City because she needed to start over somewhere else. She thanked her for everything and claimed that she would write to Carl and let him know how to get in touch with her. Betty was not fooled. She knew that Lisa wasn't good on a typewriter and would have opted to handwrite the letter. The tone didn't sound like Lisa at all, and she also remembered that Lisa told her she had signed blank pieces of paper for quote-unquote, them. All of this information was relayed to the police, who now needed to question John Robinson. John Robinson was born on December 27, 1943, in Cicero, Illinois, just outside of Chicago. His father, Henry, was a machinist, and his mother, Alberta, was a stay-at-home mom. John had four siblings, Henry Jr., Donald, Joanne, and Mary Ellen. It's said that John had a decent childhood, so it might have been the local crime that influenced John to make money throughout his life through less than legal means. Cicero was famous for being the headquarters for Al Capone, who ran his empire from a building only a few blocks away from where John was born. Though Capone was gone before John was born, organized crime was still a big part of the area. It would take some time, though, before John was sucked into the promise of easy money. He became a Boy Scout at 12 and eventually worked his way up the ranks to Eagle Scout. When he was 14, he was placed in the prestigious Quigley Seminary, a private Catholic school that prepared boys with an education, preparing them for priesthood. John would say when he was young that he wanted to serve the Vatican. By the time John graduated from the seminary, his plans of becoming a priest were gone. He got average grades while there and eventually enrolled in a local college taking classes to become an x-ray tech. Despite getting poor grades and dropping out after two years, John didn't let that stop him. In the absence of any real qualifications or training, John just lied. He eventually fabricated fake, framed certificates from all the imaginary programs he had completed. He tricked a number of medical centers into employing him as an x-ray tech even though he had no qualifications. This was how John spent his early 20s, and it was the start of his lifetime as a con artist. At the Overland Park Police Department, Detective Larry Dixon was looking into the disappearance of Lisa and Tiffany Stacy, but he couldn't find any illegal activity. Like authorities always say when an adult goes missing, it's not illegal to go missing. He had interviewed John, who said that Lisa had been there, but she met a man named Bill who became her new boyfriend, and they were going to run off and start a new life. There wasn't much else authorities could do, but the situation still bothered Detective Dixon because this was very similar to another missing persons case. A few months earlier, they had gotten a call from a man named Bill Godfrey who was reporting his daughter Paula missing. Paula Godfrey was born on June 19, 1965 in Olathe, Kansas, just outside Kansas City. She began ice skating at the age of five and dreamt of becoming a professional figure skater. After graduating high school, she tried out for a spot on the Walt Disney World on Ice show, but she was sick the day of the tryouts, which affected her performance. Not one to be discouraged, she intended to practice and try out the next year, and in the meantime, she would find a local job. Paula responded to an ad in the classifieds for a secretarial position at a company called Equitu. Her father was out of town at the time when she had the interview, but she came home and told her mother that she had gotten the job. She said that her new boss, John Robinson, had explained that he would be flying her and a few other new employees to San Antonio for a course on clerical skills. On September 1, 1984, John arrived at the Godfrey house and picked up Paula, claiming to be taking her to the airport. Her family never saw her again. After having not heard from Paula in four days, her father, Bill, flew out to San Antonio to check on her. He discovered that she had never checked into the hotel that she was supposed to be staying at. When he got back home, he reported Paula missing and then went to the Equitu office to confront John. Bill told him that he better hear from his daughter within the next few days. 
Coincidentally, a few days later, they got a letter from Paula saying she needed some time away from her family. The letter was short and handwritten, but didn't sound like their daughter since she was very close to her family. They didn't believe the letter and they reported it to police, but the next day they also got a letter from Paula explaining that she was okay and that she didn't want to see her family. Since Paula was an adult, again, they were unable to do anything. The Godfrey family knew that the letters were complete bullshit. In 1964, while working as an x-ray tech, John met a woman named Nancy Jo Lynch and he proposed to her after only a few dates. Nancy said yes and they quickly got married. Nancy was already pregnant with their first child when they got married in the Catholic Church. John's happy new life was quickly put in jeopardy when he was caught embezzling money from the hospital where he was working, still with fake credentials. He convinced his boss that he would repay the money if he didn't go to police. It's unclear if John actually repaid the money, but soon the Robinsons left Chicago and arrived in Kansas City at the end of 1964. Once there, John used his fake certificates as well as some fake letters of recommendation to secure a job as a pediatric x-ray tech. He told the hospital that he had just been accepted to medical school to become a doctor and needed a night job to help pay for his schooling. None of that was true, but they bought it and he started working. With children. It was quickly realized that John was not a very good x-ray tech and he had no idea how to work with children. Despite giving him multiple chances as well as extra training, eventually he was fired. By now, Nancy was staying at home with their first child, so John needed to keep the money coming in. He ended up landing an even better job at a private practice and x-ray lab. Here, he was able to hide his lack of skills by delegating all of his duties to other staff. As the clinic suddenly began losing money, John was coincidentally out spending lavishly. He bought a lakefront home and a new car for Nancy. Soon, the bookkeeper discovered that John had embezzled more than $100,000 from the clinic. John again offered to pay back the money if the clinic didn't call the police, but they refused. John was arrested right there in his boss's office and taken away in handcuffs. After an investigation, authorities determined that they could only prove that John embezzled $33,000 and he was found guilty by a jury. He was given a suspended sentence and three years of probation. His time on probation ends up being a steady stream of criminal activity and it's completely baffling that he doesn't end up serving prison time. Having been ousted from the medical field, John forged more certificates and talked his way into a job as a systems analyst with Mobile Oil. He was soon caught stealing $372 worth of postage and was given a deal in court to repay the money and his charge would be reduced to a misdemeanor. Then, he and his family moved back to Chicago, which violated his parole, and John began working as an insurance salesman, which wasn't a crime despite them seeming like criminals. While working there, he was caught embezzling $5,586.36. John agreed to pay the money back and the court in Illinois agreed to dismiss the case. They, however, reported the crime to his parole officer and John was ordered to return to Kansas where his parole was extended. Just so all you good people who haven't committed a crime know, a common condition of parole is that you aren't allowed to leave the state without notifying your parole officer they will regularly grant permission to leave the state for a variety of reasons. You just have to get it okayed first. Back in KC, John decided that it was time to strike out on his own. He set up his own company called Professional Services Association and marketed himself as a financial consultant for people in the medical field. This would give him access to other people's money, which he intended to keep. He started working for a couple of hospitals, but they caught on pretty quickly that he didn't know what he was doing. Then, in an attempt to bring in new capital to his company, he forged letters, one of which was from a pharmaceutical distributor claiming they wanted to buy his company. Then he sent those letters out to potential investors, telling them that they could buy stock in the company before the takeover and make a killing. That, my friends, is called securities fraud. Well, one of the investors he sent the letter to just happened to be friends with the person he forged the letter from, and soon, John found himself under arrest again. John was charged with securities fraud, mail fraud, and falsely representing Professional Services Association. He was given a $2,500 fine, 
three more years of probation, and the Securities and Exchange Commission told him not to do it again. I'm pretty sure that's the very definition of a slap on the wrist. And as a side note, Professional Services Association is the perfect example of a scam company name. It sounds professional, but is completely nondescript. It's the type of name where the owner could claim to work in any number of fields while also not really explaining what they do in any way. If you ever run into a company with a name like this, be careful. These run-ins with the law didn't slow John down. He started another company called HydraGrow, where he claimed to sell kits that would let you grow vegetables inside your home. He began looking for investors and found his first one when Brooks Ricard invested $25,000, hoping to use the return on his investment to pay for his wife's cancer treatment. The company ended up going nowhere and John abandoned the plan, keeping Brooks' money. In 1979, John was released from his parole and he got a job as the employee relations manager at Guy's Foods, a company that manufactured snack foods for fast food restaurants. Over the next nine months, John began inventing employees and having their salaries paid directly to him. He had started an affair with one of the secretaries at the company, most likely because he needed her help with the scam. When she told him she wanted him to leave Nancy and marry her, John refused and the woman turned him in. Over the course of the investigation, it was revealed that John had opened a corporate bank account under Guy's Foods' name and had used it to funnel $8,662 to himself. He had also written himself $20,000 worth of checks directly from the company account. John ended up pleading guilty to felony theft and was given a 60-day jail sentence in probation. The courts continually allowed John to serve his time on the outside, allowing him to continue to rip people off, something he clearly has no intention to stop doing. And the things he is willing to do to get money will escalate drastically. When he was released from his jail sentence, John started yet another business. This one called Equiplus, which was supposedly a venture capital company. Then he started another company called Equi2, which was supposed to be a management consultant firm. This activity apparently raised no red flags with the authorities. On June 15, 1987, Robert Bales called the Overland Park Police to report his adopted sister missing. 27-year-old Catherine Clampett was born in Korea on May 29, 1960, and traveled to the U.S. when she was a child after being adopted by family in Wichita Falls, Texas. As she grew up, she started partying and got involved with drugs and alcohol. In an effort to clean herself up, she moved to Overland Park where she lived with her brother, Robert Bales, and his wife. She had a one-year-old son who stayed in Texas with her adoptive parents. Once at her brother's house, she started looking for a job and soon she was hired as an administrative assistant for a company called Equa2. Her boss, John Dawson, explained that she would have to fly around the country for him and the position came with a new wardrobe. A few months after Catherine left with John, she was never seen again. Soon, her mother in Texas got a typed letter that was signed by Catherine, but it didn't sound like her at all. Robert called her office and asked for John Dawson, but was told that nobody worked there by that name. He then looked into one of the hotels where she had stayed and asked them who paid for her room. He was told that the room was paid for with a company card from Equa2 and the name on the card was John Robinson. Robert went to the company address and found that it had closed because John had just been sent to prison for fraud and theft. The disappearances of Lisa and Tiffany Stacy, Paula Godfrey, and Catherine Clampett would eventually all go cold. The previous five years of criminal activity had finally come back to bite John in the ass. Multiple investigations in both Kansas and Missouri were filing charges against him. He had scammed multiple individuals and businesses out of money and was found guilty of multiple counts of fraud. The prosecutor asked the judge to sentence John as a habitual offender, and he agreed. John was finally given a more substantial sentence of 5 to 19 years in prison. Nancy found a job as a nurse and sold their house, moving into a smaller apartment. Their two older kids were out of the house, but they had 16-year-old twins that were still at home. John entered prison in Kansas in May of 1986 and was paroled in January of 1991. Then he was sent to Missouri to complete his sentence there. 
As soon as he made it into prison in Missouri, he began campaigning for early parole. He had had a number of strokes while in prison in Kansas and was claiming that he should be released for health reasons. He was able to con multiple doctors into writing to the parole board and recommending his release, one doctor even claiming that it was a life-or-death emergency that he be released immediately. The parole board didn't buy it. He was transferred to a different prison in 1992 and was finally released in the spring of 1993. Before he was released, he had begun having an affair with a prison librarian, a woman named Beverly Bonner. After John was released, he moved in with Nancy, who was now living in a small mobile home. Beverly divorced her husband and was paid an $18,000 settlement for the house they owned together, as well as $1,000 a month in alimony. After the divorce was final, she was never seen again. Nobody reported her missing, and all of the focus on John for the other disappearances had faded away. On March 25, 2000, Don Troughton called the Overland Park Police to report her sister missing. Suzette Troughton was born on April 13, 1972 in Monroe, Michigan, just south of Detroit. Her parents divorced when she was 11, and it had a lasting effect on her, causing her to suffer from depression. After high school, a bad breakup caused her depression to worsen and she ended up shooting herself in the stomach. After being rushed to the hospital, she survived the ordeal and seemed to be able to turn her life around. She began working as a nursing assistant while going to school to become a registered nurse. At the same time, to blow off steam from the stress of her work and school, she started frequenting chat rooms where people would discuss BDSM. That stands for Bondage and Discipline, dominance and submission, sadomasochism. She enjoyed being a submissive person in a relationship and used the chat rooms to find a dominant partner. In early 1999, Suzette met a man online who called himself JR. In case it wasn't obvious enough, JR was John Robinson, and when he learned more about Suzette's life, he started telling her that he was a wealthy businessman and that he needed a nurse to help take care of his diabetic father while he was on a round-the-world sailing trip. In reality, John's father died when he was in prison in 1989. John told Suzette that the job paid $65,000 a year, over $100K in today's money, and also came with an apartment and a car not to mention an all-expenses-paid trip around the world. Suzette wanted to come to Kansas and meet his father before she agreed to take the job, and John agreed. He hired a limousine to pick her up at the airport, showed her a giant mansion that he claimed was his, and took her to meet his father. He had gotten people to pretend to be his father, his wife, and a number of other nurses that worked for him. Of course, those other nurses had nothing but glowing reviews about working for John. Suzette was impressed, and after going home to gather her belongings, she returned to Kansas City to become John's new employee. When she returned, she had brought her two Pekingese dogs with her, but a few days later, the dogs were found running loose, and Suzette was nowhere to be found. Soon, Suzette's family began receiving emails explaining that she would be leaving on her sailing trip soon and wouldn't have internet access for some time. Her mother immediately knew it wasn't her daughter, but then she got a call from John telling her that Suzette had run off with a guy she met named Jim Turner and abandoned her job. He also accused the girl of stealing from him and asked her mother to call him if she heard from her daughter. At that point, Carolyn knew something was wrong and had one of her other daughters call the police. As soon as the police were informed that her boss was John Robinson, they knew that they had heard his name before. When police dug into John's background, they found the missing persons reports from 15 years earlier and called in all the retired detectives that had worked on those cases, as well as his parole officers. They combined everything they knew to try to find if any of the victims were still alive. They believed that the most likely victim to still be alive would be Tiffany, who would be about 15 years old by then. When they thought about it, they believed that John was absolutely capable of a baby-selling scam. Having him be the last person that saw four missing women was enough to put him under surveillance. After a few weeks, they saw that he was living a double life, being a suburban family man at home, then during the day hanging out downtown with sketchy characters, meeting women at hotels. Then he would go back home and begin being a family man again. They got warrants to tap his phone and they subpoenaed his internet records. 
They discovered that John was finding women online that wanted to be a slave and he would entice them to come to town with an offer of a job. When they arrived, he would begin acting as their master and carry out BDSM sessions at a local hotel. The good news was that not all of these women would end up disappearing. During the investigation, detectives identified 17 aliases that John had used at various times over the years. One of the women, Brenda, came to town to work for a man named James Turner, and they ended up meeting at a hotel for a BDSM session. In the room, they got into an argument and the man struck her harder than he was supposed to. She got up and left, and on her way out, she asked the receptionist who had rented the room, and they said, John Robinson. She took that information to the police and filed a complaint of sexual battery. Then, a few days later, another woman filed a complaint for sexual battery, and this time, also robbery. Her story was almost identical to Brenda's story, and again, the man who paid for the room was John Robinson. On June 1st, Suzette's family got letters that looked to have been written on a computer and printed, with Suzette's signature at the bottom. They were postmarked in Mexico, and authorities would later learn that John had given the letters to the mother of an acquaintance who was visiting from Mexico. He asked her to mail them when she returned home, and she agreed. The letter claimed that Suzette was happy and had quit smoking. It also said that her two Pekingese dogs loved being on the boat. The family knew that this was not true because by now, they knew that her dogs had been found and taken to an animal shelter in Kansas City. They were unfortunately split up, but were both adopted out to new owners. With the arrival of these letters, along with the complaints of sexual battery and theft, the district attorney filed an arrest warrant for John Robinson. Police surrounded John's trailer on the morning of June 2nd, 2000. He was arrested without incident, and at first, Nancy had no idea because she was in the office of the trailer park where she worked as the manager. A neighbor had to walk over there to tell her what was going on. Crime scene technicians searched the home from top to bottom. They removed multiple computers, a couple of fax machines, and boxes of other items. They also towed John's vehicle. Amongst the documents, they found that John had two rental storage units, one rented in his name and one rented in Nancy's name, though there's never been any evidence that Nancy knew the extent of what her husband was doing. They also discovered that John owned a farm property in Lacine, about an hour south of where he lived. Authorities got warrants to search the storage units and farm, and they went to the closer of the two storage facilities first. At Needmore Storage, less than two miles from the Robinson trailer, inside Unit B-18, detectives found a leather briefcase that contained Suzette Troughton's social security card, birth certificate, and passport application. They also found a two-page slave contract that was signed by her agreeing to have John be her slave master. In a plastic bin, they found a college ID for another woman, but this name they had never heard of, Isabella Luisca. Then they found more blank sheets of paper with both Suzette and Isabella's signatures on them, with envelopes that had already been filled out with their family members' addresses. They now had more circumstantial evidence that John was involved in the disappearances of multiple women, but they still had no idea where he had disposed of the bodies, or evidence that they were even dead. At this point, John was only charged with two counts of sexual battery and one count of theft, but his bail was far more than he could afford. He refused to talk to detectives, so he sat in jail awaiting the additional charges that were inevitably coming. Nancy was questioned by detectives, and she told them that she suspected John was having an affair, but had no idea what was really going on. After she was released, she went into hiding and never returned to the trailer home. The next morning, authorities went to the 16-acre farm and began searching every inch. There was a trailer home on the property, but nothing was inside of it. There was also a tool shed that didn't contain anything of value either. Next to the shed, though, they found a number of barrels, some smaller, but two were large 88-gallon hazmat barrels. When they started moving one of the barrels, they could see blood seeping out of it. They pried off the top, and inside was the body of Suzette Troughton. The other barrel contained a body, but they didn't immediately know who it was. After an autopsy, that body was identified as Elizabella Luica. Isabella was born in 1978 in Poland, where her parents both worked as scientists. 
They emigrated to the United States in 1993 and settled in West Lafayette, Indiana. Isabella was 15 years old when they moved and she didn't know any English, but she took lessons from a neighbor and quickly found her place within a group of artists at her high school. After graduating, she wanted to become a fashion designer and began attending Purdue University's School of Liberal Arts. She was outgoing when it came to art, but very shy personally. She began exploring the internet and became interested in the BDSM community. This is where she met John Robinson. Soon, Isabella quit school and suddenly moved to Kansas City. John would later claim that he didn't ask the young woman to move. She had done it to surprise him, and he initially asked her to go back to Indiana. He said when he first saw her dressed in all black with piercings, he was embarrassed and didn't want to continue, but she begged him to stay and eventually the two started a relationship. Isabella got an apartment and she began doing layout work for a magazine that John had started about the trailer home life. A few months after she arrived, records show that she and John went to the Johnson County Courthouse and applied for a marriage license. John had already been married for 32 years, so he gave his name with a different middle name. Isabella also claimed to be in her 30s. Records show that nobody ever returned to pick up the license, though, and in the fall of 1999, Isabella disappeared. Her parents received an occasional letter, signed by Isabella, of course, describing how she was traveling around the world and they didn't question it. At the time, when John was asked what happened to her, he claimed that she was arrested for drugs and deported back to Poland. An autopsy revealed that both women died from blunt force trauma to the head, most likely a ball-peen hammer. They had no defensive wounds, suggesting that they were attacked in their sleep or when they were looking the other way. Authorities had to get a separate warrant for the second storage facility since it was in the city of Raymore in Missouri. As soon as they opened Unit E2, they saw three more barrels and were sure of what was inside. The barrels each contained a body. One belonged to Beverly Bonner, the prison librarian who police had recently connected to John, but the other two were more unknown women. They turned out to be Sheila Faith and her 15-year-old disabled daughter, Debbie. They had all died from blunt force trauma to the head. Sheila Howell was born in 1948 in Dallas, Texas. Her parents divorced when she was five years old, and her mother took her and her brothers to live with their grandmother. Not long afterward, Sheila's mother bailed and the kids were then raised by their grandmother. This parental abandonment most likely drove Sheila's need for love, and when she met John Faith in the late 70s, they quickly married. Debbie was born in 1979, and she was diagnosed with cerebral palsy, and even though the family struggled financially, Debbie grew up to have an outgoing personality that made her popular in school. In 1991, John Faith died of cancer and Sheila had to go on welfare, barely making enough to survive. Debbie's condition was getting worse and there wasn't enough time to take care of her and have a job. Sheila had also become increasingly lonely and had taken to the internet to find someone that could rescue her from a life of poverty. After a few failed attempts at relationships with other men, Sheila met John Robinson in a chat room in 1994. John spent time romancing Sheila online before moving to the phone. He found out about her husband's death and her daughter's disability, specifically about how much in Social Security she got each month. It wasn't long before he offered to move them to Kansas City, where he would help Sheila find a job and help Debbie with her medical needs. Like he had done many times before, John arrived at where Sheila and Debbie were staying and picked them up to take them to Kansas City. He loaded the women and their luggage into a van and drove away, and they were never seen again. Of course, soon Sheila's brother began receiving typed letters with Sheila's signature at the bottom, telling him that they were doing well and happy. He was suspicious, so he called the Social Security office and asked where their checks were being sent, but they told him they couldn't give out that information. The Social Security Administration would later disclose that they had received a letter from a Dr. William Bonner claiming that Debbie was completely disabled and needed full-time care for the rest of her life. That would raise the amount of benefits she was receiving. Dr. William Bonner was Beverly's ex-husband and he had never seen Debbie, let alone sent a letter to the Social Security Administration. It turned out that the Social Security checks were being sent to the same P.O. box where Beverly's alimony checks were being sent. Investigators searched everywhere on the farm. 
They dug in various areas, including under the trailer. They even drained a pond on the property, but they didn't find any more bodies. John had also helped purchase a home in Florida for his son, and though it had since been sold, investigators searched that property as well. Nothing. On June 13th, John was charged with five counts of first-degree murder between Kansas and Missouri. He would be tried for each murder in the state their bodies were found. Both states expressed that they would be seeking the death penalty. It wasn't long before the prosecutor in Kansas also added a murder charge for Lisa Stacy, despite the body having not been found. On October 7, 2002, John Robinson went to trial in Kansas for the murder of Lisa Stacy, Suzette Troughton, and Elizabella Lewicka. He pleaded not guilty and was easily found guilty on all three counts. I mean, the evidence was overwhelming. John was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Lisa and death for the murders of both Suzette and Isabella. In Missouri, the prosecutor offered to not seek the death penalty if John confessed to the murders of Paula Godfrey and Catherine Clampett. John agreed and he acknowledged that he was involved in their deaths but wouldn't tell anyone where the bodies were located. He pleaded guilty to five counts of first-degree murder and was sentenced to five life sentences without the possibility of parole. These sentences would only be served if he somehow made it out of prison in Kansas, which is unlikely. The Kansas Supreme Court did vacate two of his convictions, the murders of Lisa Stacy and Suzette Troughton, based on technicalities, but I couldn't find any explanation of what that meant. They did uphold his murder conviction of Isabella Lewicka and its accompanying death sentence. He remains on death row awaiting execution. He's 78 years old. The bodies of Lisa Stacy, Paula Godfrey, and Catherine Clampett have never been recovered. There are most likely more victims that we will never know about. Right about now you're probably wondering, but what happened to Tiffany Stacy? During the investigation into John Robinson, his brother, Donald Robinson, came forward to tell authorities that he believed he might have adopted Tiffany. In 1985, Donald and his wife were having trouble conceiving, so they mentioned to John that they were going to adopt. Immediately, John stepped in and offered his help. He claimed that he knew people and could help them out with the adoption. John was such a scam artist that he immediately jumped on the opportunity because he believed he could make a few bucks. All he needed was a young woman with a newborn. He began calling hospitals, claiming that he had just started an outreach program aimed at helping struggling young mothers. This eventually led him to the Hope House and Lisa Stacy. He got her to a hotel room where he made her sign adoption documents and blank pieces of paper. Then he killed her and dumped her body. The following day, he delivered Tiffany to his brother and sister-in-law and collected $5,000 in adoption fees. They raised her as their legally adopted daughter the entire time. They had no idea that the adoption wasn't legal as some of the paperwork had judges' signatures on it, all forged by John. He murdered a young woman so he could scam money from his own brother. Her name was now Heather, and she was 15 years old at the time of the discovery. She chose to stay with her adoptive parents. They were good, loving parents and were also victims of John Robinson. Her biological father, Carl Stacy, asked for permission to meet her. He said that he had no problem with her remaining with her adoptive parents and would not try to get custody. All he wanted was to be able to get to know his daughter. He was ultimately just happy to know that she'd turned up alive the one piece of good that came out of decades of horror. If you're the victim of domestic abuse, please reach out to someone for help. Please talk to your local battered women's shelter or call the National Domestic Abuse Hotline at 1-800-799-SAFE. That's 1-800-799-7233. Or you can go to thehotline.org to chat with someone online. The great thing about this website is that, at any time, hitting the escape key twice will take you to a Google search page. That way, if your abuser is nearby, you won't get caught looking for help. If you're having feelings of harming yourself or someone else, or even just need someone to talk to, please contact your local mental health facility, call 911, or call Mental Health America, who operate the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. They're available 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, and will talk to you about any mental health issue you might be facing. 
Thanks so much for watching this video. You can help us out by hitting the like button or leaving us a comment. You can also subscribe to the show to ensure you don't miss an episode. If you'd like to support the show, you can do that by checking out our merchandise at Teespring. You can also discuss the channel and the episodes on our subreddit, r forward slash this is monsters. You can find more ways to support our show and how to find us on social media by visiting thisismonsters.com. Thanks again, and be safe.